Lord Mayor, good to see you. Thank you. No, 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 thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for joining us. No, thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. Oh, Thank you so much. No, we haven't. What I Okay. Oh, is it is it Okay. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. I am Professor Karen Sayer. I'm the Professor of Social and Cultural History at Leeds Trinity University and Institutional Research Lead. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to Leeds Trinity University this evening, face to face for the first time, I think, since the pandemic began. And it's such a pleasure, I think, to have an event like this in person, finally. We're also joined by a range of guests from all over the world watching this as a live stream. And welcome to you all. I think if there were any positive outcomes from the pandemic, it was actually this level of interactivity and connectivity that we're now able to enjoy through hybrid uh, connections worldwide. This evening, the university is very proud to present the first in a new series of inaugural professorial lectures, which will be hosted 
interested to welcome professors joining the institution and promote it internally to provide a platform for their specialisms. This follows recent investment by the university in its academic leadership structures to support the strategic plan, which was launched in 2021 and runs to 2026. As some of you may be aware, research, impact and innovation is a key strategic pillar of this plan. Having gained university status in 2012, over the last 10 years, Leeds Trinity has built on its rich research culture in place since its 1966 foundation. Our university staff continue to contribute to our reputation for excellence in applied research and a research-led culture that enhances our students' learning experiences and our inaugural professorial lectures will give you a flavor of this. Before I hand over to tonight's chair, Jamie Hanley, please be aware that we are not expecting any fire drills. So if the alarm does sound, <clears throat> Please use the fire exits to the side of the room and go to the nearest evacuation point. In addition, the closest toilets are just down the corridor. Please ask a member of staff if you need directions. After tonight's lecture, there will be a Q&A session and we then hope you will join us for refreshments in the auditorium. Thank you. Without any further ado, Jamie Hanley. Well, thanks very much, Professor Sayer, and um, my Lord Mayor, High Sheriff of West Yorkshire, Sir John Battle, and ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Leeds Trinity University. Um, as Professor Sayer said, I'm Jamie Hanley, Chair of the Board here, and it's my great pleasure to be able to formally introduce our Vice-Chancellor, Professor Charles Egbu, to deliver this first in a new series of inaugural professorial lectures. Um, Charles joined us in November 2020 at such an important time for the university. And if you'll indulge me for a moment, I'd like to just share a few reflections on the contribution that he's already made here at Trinity. When our former vice chancellor announced her retirement, <clears throat> we knew that we were at something of a crossroads. <clears throat> we knew, of course, that we were blessed with a very capable body of staff, but we also knew that we needed to find an inspirational and special person to lead us into the future. So we set about our search, casting our net globally to find the right candidate. <clears throat> and we did find the right candidate. We found an inspirational leader, a great communicator, a change maker. Is he blushing yet? <laughs> Someone with a clear understanding of the challenges facing our sector and our students and with a vision to ensure that we could meet these challenges head on. And we found a man with a deep faith and a quiet determination to take us to the next level. In his first 18 months, Charles has steered us through the unprecedented challenges brought about by COVID, as well as leading our efforts to, to develop a new and ambitious strategic plan. He started the significant work, as Professor Sayer has said, to develop the university's capacity and strengthen our leadership in research. I think, Charles, we can modestly say that the last 18 months have been an exceptional start. Now, before joining us here at Leeds Trinity, Charles was the Pro Vice Chancellor at the University of East London. Before that, he held posts at London South Bank University, the University of Salford, University College London, Glasgow Caledonian, and Leeds Beckett University. As you'll know, Charles's research interests focus on project management, construction management, and sustainable development, on which he's published no fewer than 12 books and contributed to over 350 publications in international journals and conferences. He's also personally supervised over 25 PhD students and examined over 100 candidates from across the globe. As a genuine leader in his field, Charles's work has been recognized externally too. <clears throat> in 2017, he was admitted to the Worshipful Company of Constructors and he received the freedom of the City of London. He's a fellow of both the Royal Institution of Chartered Surveyors and the Association of Project Management, and he recently served as the president of the Chartered Institute of Building. In his lecture this evening, he will draw on over 20 years of personal empirical research and case studies from within the construction and built environment sectors. 
after hearing from Charles, we will all have the opportunity to ask questions. But for now, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Professor Charles Egbu. Jamie, you're so kind. Thank you so much for that uh, introduction. And, and colleagues, when you do find yourself being introduced by your chair of the Board of Governors, and you see in front of you um, such distinguished um, individuals, and you see other members of the Board of Governors, I say to myself, Charles, you have to be in your best behavior. Yeah? <laughs> so can I, can I just say uh, a huge thank you for all of you for being here. I'm indeed really, really grateful um, for your presence and for the support you are offering our university. Uh, we are very, very proud of this university. We are proud of our new strategy. We are proud of the contribution we are making in research and impact. And this is one of those opportunities to just reach out to our wider stakeholders to say, we really want to work with you in the area of research, impactful research, and we want to work with our industry, businesses, the third sector, to really, really drive, especially at this point in time, when organizations, whether they are private, public, or the third sector, are beginning to ask questions around skills shortages around talent management, around what they need to do to survive and remain in business. And if you are a private organization, what you need to do to profit maximize. And perhaps it is apt in this presentation and this lecture I want to give to really, really talk about some of those important areas, knowledge assets and innovations for sustainable competitive advantage. One of my very old professors once told me, and said, Charles, if you ever want to give a lecture in an area that is so complex and with an audience that come from a varied background, perhaps use the first slide to almost say exactly what it is you want to say for the day so that if you progress and keep trying to bore them, they could remember the first slide, yeah? <laughs> So th this first slide really, really captures the essence of my lecture. Knowledge and knowledge management, innovation and sustainable competitive advantage. What I propose to do is to try and make some arguments as to how knowledge, and then we'll come into understanding what knowledge is, how knowledge and the management of it could impact on the competitiveness of, of organizations and how it could give significant benefit, whether you're a private organization there to profit maximize or you're a public concern or your third sector. I also want to make an argument how innovation impinge on sustainable competitive advantage. And then I could try to weave through how knowledge management contributes to innovation and how collectively they really, really provide an advantageous positions for organization. And I want to look at this within the built environment sector. So as a typical academic, you then look at this slide and then you could ask a hundred question and say, but what on earth is knowledge? Where does knowledge reside? What on earth is knowledge management? Can you really, really manage knowledge? Or are you providing an environment for knowledge to be considered? How do you identify those knowledge utils and assets that really contribute to the value chain? Given that arguably knowledge is everywhere, knowledge resides in you, and how do you try to manage knowledge that walks out of the door when your very, very capable staff opens the door and say they are living. And indeed, as organizations struggle 
to get the right skill set. How do you know that the knowledge asset coming from an individual supports your strategic mission? Could you quantify that? And how does that knowledge util combine with other utils of knowledge in the organization? That's just in the knower, the individual. How about knowledge that resides in the routines, the repositories? How do you, in combined form, make some sense of managing that? And yes, how do you measure the contribution of knowledge to competitiveness? Again, you could ask the same question on innovation. What on earth is innovation? How do you address the typologies of innovation, whether it's innovation emerging organically from an organization or innovation that is adapted or adopted? Or if we use the language of the later Peter Drucker, innovation that has been swiped, i.e. copied from elsewhere into your organization. And of course, let's not forget there is imposed innovation. Many of us have seen in the last two years how true regulations, the government have imposed innovations to us, new way of doing things, whether it's the social distancing or how long we need to open our businesses and close our businesses or the new modality in which we do. So how does these different typologies of innovation impact on sustainable competitiveness? Again, you ask yourself, what on earth is sustainable competitiveness? Now, that's the academic in me. Are with me? Then you ask yourself, how do organizations position themselves to have an advantage over others? And then you begin to look at the different schools of thoughts. Many of you would have been akin and very, very used to the work of uh, uh, Michael Potter many, many years ago, the, the five forces although that work has been in a way discredited. But organizations position themselves in different ways. You look at the resource school of thought, you look at the core competencies and the dynamic capabilities. I'll say a bit about them. How do these different things impact on how a day-to-day -day organization live their work? And more importantly, how do we see to it this within an organizational context. So you begin to see so many questions. And what my professor did say to me, it's when you set this tall out and you instill in, in, your, in your delegates all these kind of questions, you are bound to get one or two questions at the end of the day. So what all I've done is to make sure I prime you to ask questions at the, at the end of the day. Now, there are four, four things I'd like to do. I'd like to say a bit about the context in which I want to look at this. And this, this is a work um, myself, my, my colleagues, my researchers um, internationally have been doing around knowledge, knowledge management, strategic management, why organizations innovate, and why certain organizations deliberately exnovate and stop innovation. And when you look at the pharmaceutical industry, where organizations put out some drugs deliberately for two years and withdraw, they exnovate. Why do organizations do that? And why do organizations that you think are innovating suddenly stop innovating and they go out of business? What's gone wrong? So these are some of the things we want, we, we, we've, we've been looking at over many years. And because this is about the research we've been doing. I'm sure I won't be forgiven by academics here if I don't situate my research and explain how, as an academic researcher, I have positioned myself appropriately for the research I have been doing over these years. In other words, what's the philosophical lens in which a researcher uses to approach his or her research? And how does that philosophical position inform the methodological approach he or she uses? And how does the methodological approach inform the method and the techniques he use? Uh, some of the academics in front of us are, are always uh, of the view that when our research students come and say, oh, I'm going to use questionnaire, I'm going to use interview to do our work. And you grill them and say, can they justify why is interview or questionnaire? They struggle, isn't it?
because that rudimentary of how the philosophical positioning informs the methodology and in turn methodology informs the method is not there. So one of the things I was fortunate about uh, in many years, I, I did have those who supervised and drilled in me the importance of the quality of research and how it needs to be embedded from first principle. So if important, I provide my lens for my research and then move on. And I'd want to share with you some of those uh, research and case studies and then reflect on some of my research and see how it might be applicable to what is happening around us today. We hear of leveling up. We hear of building back better. We hear of talent management, skills shortages and skills gap. And we know the government of the United Kingdom is keen in 2025 to introduce what they've called lifelong loan entitlement so that people could begin to come and acquire knowledge assets in universities or elsewhere and organizations allowing them to do that within the confines of the work they do. So what has knowledge management got to do in our day-to-day -day lives? So I want to sit with this within the built environment because I've spent the last 35 years uh, associating myself with the built environment. So here you have the definition of the built environment. Um, a man-made surrounding that provides the setting for human activity, and this could range from the buildings and all other things constructed by human beings, and it is that space in which we live, we work, and recreate, and do our day-to-day -day business. We are now in the lecture theater. This is man-made. This is the built environment. Indeed, there's nothing we do that you couldn't bring in the built environment. We've all come through a form of transport, either through road, or I won't say it by air, but some people may have. But whatever you do, it is something that you have gone through the built environment. Roads, bridges, dams, rail tracks. And, and I just want to say that there is a huge life cycle because at times when you hear people talk about construction, there is a perception, isn't it to do with bricks, mortar, and just building? It's a huge sector. And it's a sector that contributes greatly to the gross domestic product of the United Kingdom. The whole construction and its associated area contributes 7% of the United Kingdom's GDP. 110 billion pounds a year, employs about 3 million people, over 340,000 businesses, albeit 95% of them are small size businesses, and about 140 of those businesses employ over 500 people. And we know that the construction industry is used by the government as a barometer for measuring the economic um, activities. When there's real recession, the construction industry is the first to go into recession and the very last to come out of reduction. And many of you would almost always know that when you see all these uh, huge plant and equipment uh, across site, it shows you that uh, something is good about the economy. And when you don't see those, it means that uh, there are some challenges. But you think about the built environment, Starting from land acquisition to somebody thinking of working on the land and building, getting planning permission, designing it, construction proper, maintain facilities management, and after life, it goes down or you refurbish or you demolish. And a typical construction project should be lasting for about 70 years. So I, I just want to sit with what I'm saying. And I think it's fair to say that that construction industry over the last many years have seen real innovation, whether it's in the modern method of construction where we construct uh, off-site and bring to, bring to site. And there's now huge dry construction. I remember in my, in my day uh, as a, a student of quantity surveyor in Leeds here uh, over 30 years ago, as a, as a quantity surveyor, I used to carry the theodolite 
and tripod across legs, trying to measure and level the surface. Now, what do you have? You have the GIS, you have drones helping you to do that just in my lifetime. Huge innovations. Um, and of course, you have 3D printing, you have robotics, you have the Internet of Things that allows us to do that connection. You have all kinds of things uh, going on. And some of these uh, innovations have come because we need to improve health and safety. We need to address the issue of climate change. We need to address the issue of decarbonization. And we need to reduce the greenhouse gas and also address the issue of our, our workforce. But uh, it's interesting to say that when you look at this picture, it looks very rosy and nice. And it talks about technological innovation. But this is an industry that has three times, more than three times the average suicide rate in the country. One of the worst industries in terms of mental health. It is an industry where 30% of construction sites have no hot water or toiletry facilities. An industry where it's heavily male dominated. There is macho culture, there's bullying, it's high, highly labor intensive. The mobility of the workforce is unbelievable indeed because it's project based. One project finishes and the project can be a week, two weeks, three months, one year, two years, three years, and people are moving up and down. Then it begs the question, what's the stake of each individual workforce? How might they be contributing their knowledge assets so that the projects they work on, those knowledge assets, those innovations, those change management, those benefits within a project environment is transferred from a project environment into an organizational knowledge base. How are we going to do that so that there's no reinventing the wheel, no repetition? And you have an industry where it is difficult to predict the next job. When you ask a typical subcontractor, whether it's a labor-only subcontractor, they might tell you, mate, I'm not sure where I'm going to be next week or two weeks. So we are innovating technologically. How about other process innovations? So you have a project-based industry. And why I'm saying this is the context specificity of knowledge management as you manage knowledge within a context, and that's important. And that context plays a role in how knowledge contributes to innovation and to competitiveness. So you have an industry that has a multi-firm networks, temporary nature of the projects, movable fist, people move around, loosely coupled and weak ties of actors. So you come to site, you see the bricklayer, you see the uh, painter, you see the um, um, subcontractor, you see the engineer, they meet and say hello and work and have meetings and in a week and two weeks, they don't see one another, they all disappear. Unlike a very stable organization, perhaps like a university, where you, you see your colleagues for weeks and months and years. And how knowledge transforms within a supply chain and how they move the value add from one particular part within the um, supply chain, I think is important. Little incentive, and because the projects are open, people see the buildings. There's an argument that, well, if people can see your building and see your design, well, they can copy that. Where is the innovation? How do you protect your innovation? Question mark. So, so what is knowledge? Um, those who have been following this area, we know that the issue of knowledge is not new. Um, we know that this has been considered a long time by great philosophers like Plato, Aristotle, Socrates. We also know that when they were considering this, perhaps they're considering this in isolation. And we know that there are disciplinary areas like marketing, economics, psychology, librarianship, that are looking into a little bit about what knowledge means. But I think it's 
One of the work done in 1958 by Michael Puryanyi that really, really informed looking at knowledge management from a very, very interdisciplinary area and asked the question, what does knowledge mean? What is knowledge asset? How can we provide tangibility in what is intangible? And then Peter Drucker, our late Peter Drucker, was the first person in the 1960s that coined the phrase a knowledge worker. And of course, those who work in this area will know that it's Thomas, Thomas Stewart in the very early 90s that talks about the important role of intangible assets, the intellectual capital, the role that human capital plays in organizational settings, the role that customer capitals, your customer, the knowledge they have, how they can make or create your business, how they can be your ambassadors, and how they will sell your product. Those intangible knowledge assets and the knowledge that resides in routines, in processes. And then the management aspect tells us a story that if we ignore the other factors of production used in the um, last century and in the 20th, 19th century, land as a factor of production. Where do we get an advantage from intangible assets? So real research began to take place in knowledge management in, from 1995. And I had the pleasure of working with the first professor of knowledge management in the United Kingdom, a great friend of mine, Professor Paul Quintas of the Open University Business School. And if there's anybody who has enlightened me in my academic career, it must be Paul Quintus. He had that power of being able to make complex things very, very simple. Something I haven't learned. <laughs> but uh, he had a wonderful way of doing that. And he was able to explain the difference between data, information, knowledge, experience, and wisdom and also being able to explain the difference between explicit knowledge and tacit knowledge, and arguing that there's something called implicit knowledge in between. And it's the power of those knowledge assets. Um, and he was able to say that these are some of the utils of knowledge. Smart added value in products, knowledge in people, knowledge in processes, knowledge in the corporate memory. And that's why when you have people who have spent many, many years, and we we'll see that in construction, your foreman who has spent 35 years and walks out of the door for retirement. And if that knowledge hasn't been passed from the individual into a, an organizational knowledge base, you begin to have that corporate memory loss. And that's another power of knowledge and how that can contribute to what you do. And if you look at the typical construction industry, where you have the client of the construction and you have the business of the organization, and part of the business is making money through projects. So you have an organization that has projects. So they make money when the projects go well. And if the projects don't go well, that hasn't. So where is the know why, the know how, the know who, the know what? How does knowledge flow in this? So I'll give you an idea of what knowledge could be. The question is, what does knowledge management mean? And there are many definitions, but I think these are some of the, the couple of definitions I like. Is the management of any process of creating the knowledge, acquiring, capturing it, sharing it and using it wherever it resides, so that you exploit it for new opportunities or benefits. And for, for some of us who have had the pleasure of looking into this area, there was uh, some work done by Nonaka and Tekuchi, one of the best works around knowledge management. And it was making a case that if you look at the two extremes typology of knowledge, the explicit knowledge, which is the knowledge we can codify, and the tacit knowledge, which too often is, resides in us, the knower. How do you now, in, in sharing knowledge, how do you transfer tacit knowledge into explicit knowledge? 
explicit knowledge into explicit knowledge. And they came up with what is called the SECI model, S-E-C-I, the socialization, how you can transfer tacit to tacit, the externalization, the transfer knowledge and the integration. So that's the key model. Why is there something good about this? I think some of the work we have done have somehow discredited this model. Because this model works on the premise that indeed we can transfer our tacit knowledge into other people's knowledge. And we forget something called the stickiness of knowledge, which means that knowledge is in us. And it's difficult to really, really give it to somebody else if the context is not right. And it's the appropriateness of the context is important. The example I often give is, if you look at a typical five-year-old child, we know they cannot write very, very well. They are smart. And they stay close by their grandparents, their grandma, mom, and they're telling them story. The only way knowledge can pass from grandma to a five-year-old must be true communication and storytelling. That's the most appropriate. The boy can't write. The boy can't read very well. Are with me? If you want to impart that knowledge, you must find the most appropriate way. And that's the importance of the context specificity of knowledge. And so organizations may find themselves in a position where the context is right for that knowledge to take place. If that's not right, perhaps the utility of that knowledge yeah, cannot. So in our work, we noted that there are two different strategies for knowledge management. The codification, where you try to um, write that down, codify that, and then put it down. And the personalization, which is knowledge closely tied to the knower and the person. So say a bit about innovation. I also had the pleasure of uh, doing some research in innovation. And uh, one of the challenges about innovation is to make that distinction between creativity, invention, and innovation. And some of the earlier works we've done, really, really interesting work, especially by the, the works of Reichardt in 1982, that really, really showed that creativity and innovation are different. And I think she did say the two classical differences between creativity and innovation is that innovation is a social process, must be a social process. Creativity may not be. Now you can be a creative writer on your own as an individual, but you cannot go through innovation without having more than one person in a social process. And he, he did intimate that creativity is coming up with the idea Whereas the innovation is the successful and intentional introduction and exploitation of that idea, where that idea is new to the unit of adoption and it has a significant benefit. So the issue of serendipity shouldn't be there. The differentiation between creativity, which could be a part of the innovation process, and the issue about invention, invention may not be innovation. And invention is the early part of bringing to bear a technological uh, idea. But that invention may not see the light of day. So it's not innovation. And, and th these definitions are really, really important. So there are different types of uh, uh, innovation, process innovation, product innovation, and incremental and radical innovations. And, and people would have had uh, all kinds of uh, terminologies, disruptive innovation, open, closed, emergent, adopted. These are really, really important. And the typology of innovation has a role in how it impacts into um, successful competitive advantage. So competitive advantage, in my view, is the company's ability to perform in one or more ways that competitors cannot. And I think it chimes with uh, uh, Philip Kotler. And sustainable competitive is the ultimate determinant of success and failure. The question is, why do organizations go to innovate? Do they want to go to innovation to capture the market and be the first in the market? Or do they want to be the, the, the second follower 
Do they just want to be there and come out or be there and stay where they are? Or do they want to sustain that innovation for a period of time? How does, what does it take to have sustained innovation? And we looked at that. I just want to finish this before I go into the, the, the case studies quickly. There are many schools of thoughts in this area. Um, there is the classical school of thought by uh, people like Porter and the Schumpeterian view that talks about, think about the external, look at your competitors, look at the cost and the differentiation. Now, the challenge about the school of thought is that they're always looking outward. They're not looking around inside the resources that exist. They also take the view, especially in the transactional uh, approach, which the works of Williamson uh, was looking into. He's saying the reason why Charles brings in a new staff is because Charles has seen the knowledge assets. Charles brings in that individual, pays that individual, and that individual works. So Charles is paying for his or her knowledge assets and nothing more. Now that's a Schumpeterian view. Now the resource-based view said, no, it's more than that. That that individual that comes in will also have to develop because that knowledge as assets may end up becoming what Leonard uh, Dorothy Barton tells us, a core rigidity. Because that knowledge has to be informed and developed so that it contributes to what is called a dynamic capability to support the organization. So the different schools of thought, the schools of competencies and dynamic capabilities impact on how we do things. I just want to quickly talk, 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 talk on the research philosophy because the lens in which a researcher uses uh, determines how the research is done. And you have to forgive me, I'm an anarch in this area, and I, I don't want to bore you, Steve. But I think the way you look into the research you do is important. And there are three important things. One is something called the epistemological positioning of the researcher. In other words, the origin of knowledge, the knowledge you use in your work, those knowledge base you draw that you believe are knowledge assets that are really, really known in your area. And who are the giants that have come before you for whom you are standing on their shoulders? That's what epistemolo epistemology is. And in epistemology, you have a positivist approach or an interpretivist, interpretivist approach. And the interpretivist approach is saying there's more, there's more than one interpretation and understanding of this. The positive says, Maybe there's one, it's narrow-minded. The other thing is the ontological positioning, what the real world is like. Do you see the real world as simple or complex? And in the area I've, I've been working on, knowledge management and innovation, they are very complex. And the real world says, can you study this area in the absence of the actors and the players in the area? So within the ontological positioning, you have the objectivist and the constructivist view. The constructivist view is saying the world is simple and messy. There are different voices. To understand this, you have to immerse yourself in the world of the actors to understand that well. And that's really, really important, unlike the objectivist. And of course, the asiological position in a researcher takes is about the kind of value ladenness they have. Are you coming with a, a, a neutral, value-free, or are you really, really burdened with some biases? And I think that's important. And why that is important is because your epistemological positioning and your ontological framework and your axiological standpoint really, really informs the particular methodological approach you take. Now, if you are if you have an epistemology that is highly interpretivist and you have an ontological framework that is moving towards constructivism, then the kind of methodology you choose is moving towards the interview, ethnography, let the natives tell you. And I think that's really, really important. So just try to end off with the case studies I was doing. One of the very case, few test case studies we did uh, this is a, a while back, 1996, when I was a senior research fellow at a, um, University College London. And these two names, uh, sadly, uh, two of them uh, 
uh, have, have passed on. These two were really, really instrumental in my career. If there's anything that is good I've said today, you have to really, really give thanks to these people. If it goes wrong, you know it's coming from me. I would mean, these people have really, really informed my approach to, to, to work. They taught me what research was. So we looked at how we could make sense of innovations in construction industry. Understand characteristics of innovation. What are the good things? And this research sponsored by the ESRC, the Economic and Social Research Council, was one of the very early studies that said, let's try to simulate good innovations and use a multimedia education and called the good environment for education, alpha and the not so good, so that when people immerse themselves and play the game as it were, they could deduce some of the good characteristics of innovation as opposed to the bad ones. One of the, and the study was very, very good. And we looked at different uh, companies. We looked at innovations in foundation in, in engineering, uh, concrete. And this company A, you've seen, the correct, this is an interesting organization that started life as an underpinning um, organization, trying to make sure that the foundation is strong and is not collapsing. And through an innovation trajectory and path dependency, they were able to move from foundation to, to beams, to floors, to buildings, to bungalows, to high rise. How they were innovating, innovating through what I call a, a pathway. And it shows you how knowledge assets help you over the years as they move into competencies and as they move into dynamic capabilities, how they support you in your innovation. Really, really interesting. And then we looked at a company called, uh, which is a dry cementitious material. And they had a parent company in France and they were trying to bring it into UK. And their view was, how do you reduce the labor intensiveness of the, of, of the work? So they had about 25 people doing the work and their parent company in France had only three people doing the work of 25. And they wanted to adopt. And that is an example of adopted innovation. Now, the question is, is innovation a good thing? Now, those who have lose, lost their job, the 17 might say it's not a good thing, are with me? But from an organizational point of view, it is positive. So where does innovation become a good thing and for whom? and where it is. It begins to show you some of the trickiness of innovation. And we looked at a, a, a company many, many years ago now, um, trying to see the role of digital information technology in improving teamwork. And this particular organization led me to put one of my very first EPS, EPSRC projects as a, a principal investigator. I was arguing the negative and the disbenefits of technology. For the first time, this is in the 19, late 1990s. So I put a case to say technology, if we don't manage it well, destroys the social tacit knowledge that flows. And many of us over the last two years using Zoom and using MS Team have seen that it worked, but there was something missing. The, that social network, that issue of trust, that issue of respect, that issue of reciprocity, that you cannot quantify what is still there. Are you with me? And that perhaps an organization gives them that competitive advantage. So um, I, we learned quite a lot from that. And these are some of the works of my, um, my, my students. This uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Benny Hidayat now, um, he finished in 2012. He was from Indonesia. And you, you will know in 2004, there was this tsunami in Indonesia, in the Aceh, 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 Aceh province. So that impacted him and his family so much. And he came to me and said, Charles, how can we, because Indonesia is prone to uh, earthquakes, how can we learn from all the earthquakes, draw the knowledge assets and bring that to bear in how we project manage the reconstruction after post-disaster? And we did some work and that work was to produce a model and a set of guidance to improve awareness and how key players 
uh, work in this area, the NGOs, the project managers, those uh, displaced community. And then we produced a model that shows the different aspects of um, reconstruction, the project management of it, and how individual me uh, members could share their knowledge assets, learn from lessons of previous earthquakes, provide a repository of post-mortem of what happens after previous, and use that for the benefit of yet new uh, work. We also looked into uh, a work which is a, um, sponsored by the EPSRC on how knowledge management and knowledge mapping can bring about change. I'm conscious of the time. How are we doing? Yeah. Um, um, looking at our knowledge mapping, and knowledge mapping is that process whereby you ascertain in a typical process map of what you want to do, where the key knowledge assets exist, what, what decision making has to be made in the usage of those knowledge assets, especially those that add to the value chain. So we wanted to draw this, and we wanted to see how we improve knowledge creation, how knowledge is created and transferred within and between organizations, and how it's applied in the context of the glass recycling uh, uh, sector. So we wanted to understand what goes on in the life cycle of glass recycling? So if this were uh, a glass bottle and it's br broke, what happens before it's put together? What happens till it finds its uh, at end of use? So we look at the process map of sources of glass, how it's collected, how it's recycled, the distributors, the different markets from glass ma manufacturing right to the usage of glass as a foam. And we then wanted to look at the decision making in each of those market areas. And we then talked about what are the drivers at play, legislation, market forces, regulations, what are the strategies organizations want to take? What are the tactics? What, what does results look like? And how does knowledge sharing impact on those results? So we looked at each of those areas, the glass collection, the recycling, looked at them in detail, wanted to find out the strategic actions that needed to be taken, wanted to find out the tactical actions, the roles of the individuals, the knowledge workers, the competencies they bring to their work, what good results look like, and in the market, what will this thing be used for, a glass we know, whether it's used for foam glass, decorative applications, paint filler. And this is how you look at the relationship between what you do and the role that knowledge plays. And at every stage, we're looking at the knowledge assets, the knowledge flows within the supply chain and where the knowledge gaps exist. And when I say this, I do ask questions when we talk about building back better talk about leveling up, talk about talent management and the skills. It seems to me there's quite some application we can learn and glean from this uh, in some of the challenges that face us. So the, the, the bottom line was really, really useful uh, work to really look at the interplay between decision-making, the process map and knowledge flows, knowledge as a stock, i.e. knowledge that resides in repositories and knowledge as a flow, knowledge in our thinking and in decision making, and how you bring those together to become a powerful set of assets. Uh, this is another work of one of my PhD students. Uh, I happen to have a, um, got the pleasure of a super, <laughs> supervising um, two husbands and wives, a student and a mother, um, all kinds of combination. And some of them have come from Malaysia. I, I used to be uh, a visiting professor uh, in, in, in Malaysia. And I often give out my time to go to universities to lecture on how to do research. And through that, many, many of them have always come back to me to say, Charles, we want you to supervise our work. So this is one of those uh, our students, uh, Ida. We looked at knowledge sharing approaches in Malaysian construction organization. This is an interesting work because for the first time, we wanted to understand what knowledge 
sharing means. How do you incentivize people to share knowledge? Why do people hoard knowledge? And what's the role of culture in energizing the sharing of knowledge? And we coined a phrase that, yes, we understand that knowledge is seen as power. Why should I share your knowledge? If I do that, perhaps I've lost my competitive advantage in the organization. Then we coined the phrase that not only should organizations be minded of knowledge power, we then talked about what we called the increasing returns of knowledge. Now, you share your knowledge with you, with me, you haven't lost your knowledge. I've benefited. If I share my knowledge with you, I haven't lost my knowledge. You benefited. And there's an increasing returns of knowledge. And just see how powerful it will play a role in helping organizational effectiveness. And the important thing is how do you then capture this accumulation of knowledge assets for the benefit of the organization? So we looked at how ready organizations are in sharing knowledge. And the maturity model of organizations in trying to implement a knowledge management strategy. This is another work, um, again, from a Malaysian student, uh, Othman. Uh, knowledge sharing initiatives in local uh, authorities. One of the things that uh, you will know, and perhaps there's a sense here in the UK, that uh, getting planning permission is, 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 is not just an art or a science. It, it can be challenging, I would mean. Um, and, and they also have the same problem. Uh, in, in Malaysia, and we wanted to look at how knowledge sharing in different stages of the planning process could improve efficiency, improve the quality and speed time. Uh, and that was very, very useful. And Ida did an excellent work. And she received quite so much uh, acknowledgement and she published widely from her work. We also looked at uh, another work that uh, looked at how knowledge mapping supports facilities performance evaluation. So if you're a client with big facilities, you want to look at this, the, the hard facilities management, the building as an asset. You also want to look at the soft FM, the cleaning, the painting, the decorating. And you want to make sure your, your building is at its premium. Just imagine if you're a hotelier and you people are paying a premium. How do you make sure that the facilities going on, and how do you put forward a performance evaluation to make sure things are doing? So we look at uh, um, that as well. We also look at BEAM. Uh, BEAM is an important area uh, in, in, in construction industry. And I think it's, it, 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 it's, it's an area where uh, if there's a new technology that I think uh, construction needs to be proud of, is the issue of uh, uh, building information modeling. And I, I think, when you say this, it's how information, digital, digital information, supports the building, how you model it in terms of object, how you also use it in terms of networking and integration throughout the project life of a building. So the designer has a role and is helpful, the constructor, the quantity surveyor, till the end of the building. But the question is, is just about information and technology. So we wanted to find out how does experiential learning, the learning and the knowledge in the NOAA, contribute to this technology to make sure it's uh, really, really important. A good work. And the other one we did was, uh, because the construction industry is full of SME, these people are very, very busy. They haven't got the resources. We, for the first time, we looked at making a business case for knowledge. And it's interesting, I was speaking to one of the, uh, of the managers there, and I was saying, what's your view about a, a business case for knowledge management? And he said, Charles, if you think knowledge management is expensive, think about the cost of stupidity. Are with me? <laughs> um, so uh, so it's, it's important to begin to see how you make a business case for, 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 for knowledge management. And, and, we, and we did that, and we provided an approach. And one of the things we did very, very early on before, b b before the big uh, onset of technology is, we did say we will supply every um, manager with a dictaphone. We only need one minute of your time. Just as you are taking your coat to leave, 
Just say a bit about three things that went well on your site and the three things that didn't do well and switch it off. That's all. And we, we collected a huge amount of knowledge asset and information and created a repository in a stratified manner under different headings, risk, quality, health and safety. And then we produce and we had people to type and tip everything. And we created a, a repository. And the good thing is that some of those knowledge assets some individuals have, others in the company didn't know. So we made that available and it reduced repetition. Simple approach to knowledge sharing because we know there are SMEs and they haven't got. And uh, I have to say this particular research did really, really well. Myself and my colleagues and uh, um, my uh, professor David uh, Boyd and uh, Ezekiel Chinyo, Dr. Ezekiel Chinyo, um, really, really important. So I'm, I'm ending now to say, our research has told us that innovation is a complex social process. And there's no one single theory that fully explains successful innovations in every organization. That it demands an integrated process. I hope if there's anything that has come out of today's uh, lecture from me is the complexity of these areas. And there's no one little thing that is the magic bullet. And organizations innovate and are successful in how they look at all these things in unison. Culture plays a role. Structure plays a role. And of course, the regulation, the processes play a role. We also know that leveraging knowledge appropriately supports innovation. It is a social process. And I hope it's come across as a social process. Um, yes, IT plays a role. But to be a knowledge creating company, to be um, a knowledge maturity company, to be a learning organization and to practice organization now learning, IT can do it alone. The power of the people, the power of the tacit knowledge, the power of the knower is important. And at the point I was making, the culture of recognition, reciprocity, and trust is important. Again, that social dimension. Yes, leadership and strategy is important. And also, because the construction industry, because of a project-based approach, where projects stop and another one start, I think there's a need for long-term collaboration to allow some of these things. So organizations that are in longer-term collaboration are likely to do well. They are likely to build trust because they've been in association. And I think our our industry construction should try to move from an adversarial culture into a sharing culture. And we also need to think about the process innovation, not the technological innovation. We need to improve on our procurement routes, how we offer um, services to our clients. We need to think about process improvement in payments regime. It, too often, I remember when I was the uh, president of the Chattanooga Institute of Building, the two things I championed was welfare and well-being because of the high level of uh, uh, suicide. I also championed payment from the first tier of the supply chain to the, to the last tier. Contracts will say you have to pay somebody who's done your work within 30 days. Three months, six months, people aren't paid. So my question is how do we use process improvement to improve that? It's good we are doing well in technology but we need to improve what goes on in our supply chain. I just want to end here to say, I hope you can begin to see how, if we really, really are able to identify some of these knowledge assets in organizations, I think they will play an important role. And if you look at uh, some of the things coming out from the government around leveling up, where we talk about spreading opportunities more equitably around the country, where we're talking about the moral, social, and economic imperatives, where we want to talk about building up, I think there's uh, some questions to be asked. Where are the skills we need? What are the skills we need? How do we get those skills to help address inequality? And how do we look at our processes and overlay on our processes the knowledge maps that talks about the requisite value laden knowledge that helps us to make innovations in this whole area.
So I'll stop here and I hope I've uh, tried to provoke, if not instill, a util of knowledge in you. Thank you so much. Charles, what an incredible tour de force. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, you singled out one of your former colleagues uh, for praise by saying that he had the ability to take very complicated matters and make them simple and understandable, but you didn't have that skill. I think we all disagree, <laughs> but you absolutely do have that skill and you've done that this evening. Thank you so, so much. thank you very much for such an engaging and uh, interesting contribution. Um, we've got, ladies and gentlemen, about 20 minutes for questions. Um, there are some colleagues here with, with roving microphones. Um, so if you'd like to indicate, uh, we're also going to monitor questions uh, online, I think. Who's going to go first? Don't be shy. Oh, they're not shy. I can see the professors of construction okay, management here. They're never shy here. Yeah? Malcolm. Oh, sorry. Yeah, gentlemen, and then Malcolm. Oh, that's okay. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. All right. Thank you, Charles. Thanks for such a good lecture. Um, I can proudly say that I'm from the similar background from what you are, and I'm. Another thing which has made me proud today that my research, PhD research, is also on knowledge management, professional, professional knowledge in built environment. Yeah. So I, I, there's no question really. Uh, it's it's been really interesting what you've uh, shared with us. Uh, I just wanted to share my experience and the re research questions I've developed so far. Uh, is is about the that the knowledge and practice in professionalism in the built environment, they co-constitute and they cannot exist independently. And the other things is that how professionalism, professional practice and knowledge have evolved over time. So th that, that brings um, uh, many questions in mind that it, it, does knowledge actually exist somewhere or is actually being standardized or commercialized for some purposes or it, where is it coming from? So it, it's, it's, it's a lot going on at the moment. It's a lot going on in my head. Uh, I'm doing, using the narrative analysis to, uh, as a research object for that. No, it, it's, can I just attempt to answer that? I, I, well, part of it is a statement, but I think there's some um, important uh, question in that. One, one of the works I found, I found very, very useful is the work of uh, Gibbons et al. in 1994. They produced something they called new knowledge production. And it revolutionized how we look at knowledge. They looked at mode one and mode two knowledge. And mode one knowledge is the kind of knowledge academics like mine impact to our students where someone like Charles will start in front and begin to provide knowledge. And they looked at mode two knowledge, which is messy, which is the kind of knowledge professionals in real life at times stumble at, maybe not knowing that they've stumbled at. They get that through getting things wrong, learning from mistakes. Some of them losing their jobs in the processes. But those knowledge are really, really vital. And arguably, some of those knowledge assets are difficult to imitate and mimic and replicate and copy. And the literature tells us that those kinds of knowledge are knowledge assets that add more to innovation than those that are easily um, documented. So these knowledge assets res reside in people. It resides in professions. I think the challenge is, how do we transfer those tacit knowledge from the individual knower to the wider organizational base and also to supply chains? so that not only do projects they are part of benefit from that, the organizations they are part of benefit, and the supply chains where they're a member of the social network benefit. And that's where it becomes tricky, because there are so many things you need to be thinking about. Why would somebody want to share knowledge? How do you incentivize them? How do you capture that knowledge? And you saw in my presentation an attempt by Nonaka and Tekuchi to see how you make sense of how knowledge moves from tacit to tacit. Really, really interesting area and an area where we wanted to look at when we look at the maturity. Um, so I'm happy to speak with you because in local authorities in Malaysia, where we have professionals, we've attempted to do that. 
And in Malaysia, where we look at quantity surveyors and how they deal with knowledge sharing, we managed to do that. I didn't present that, but I'm happy to share some yeah, of, of course, the work. Of course. Done. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Uh, Malcolm. Uh, first of all, thanks, Charles. A really interesting talk and lot, lots for me to think about and go away and think about. But uh, firstly, uh, I think I now know what ontology and epistemology is. So <laughs> after 25 years, thank you for making it so simple. Uh, my question is, um, it's not a particularly well-framed one, but I'm, I'm interested in the relationship of innovation between a free market and the public good and the limitations that the free market can place on innovation. Uh, and I'm thinking in particular about, obviously, the recent pandemic and the pharmaceutical industry's mm -hmm. ability to react at pace collaboratively and innovate. Um, so it's perhaps not a question, but just a, a comment about where can innovation take place in the common good, the social good, for the public good versus the free market approach. Can I just ask a very, very important mm. question? And, it, and it's a question we have throughout um, my many, many years of looking into this area. Although I did stress mainly on the private sector that are there to do two things according to the classical theory of uh, innovation. They are there to remain in business and survive and to profit maximize. But we know innovation takes place in local authorities and in, in, in public. I think the, 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 the answer to your question lies on why does an organization want to innovate? What is there for them? Are they doing that out of volition or are they nudged? And I have to say, um, in the last two years, whilst we've seen the interplay between academic and industry, especially um, the pharmaceutical uh, industry to get these vaccines on. They were doing it partly because of common good, but they, be, they know in the long run there are benefits because of the way they position themselves already in the marketplace. I would mean. Um, so the, the lens in which you want to look at this may be governed by the strategic positioning of your organizations. So, for example, a university. We want to innovate. Uh, mainly procedural innovations and technological innovations, not because we want to make money out of it, just because we think it's a common good as part of the service we provide to our students, our staff, and to our stakeholders. But when you think about a profit-making organization, especially in the, in the small, medium enterprises, where it is difficult for them to know where the next workload will be in three months, every opportunity they get is to maximize profit. And their strategic intent is there. Now, if in doing that, they offer the common good, it is good, I would mean, but they will be thinking about two things. As Sean Peter and um, Williamson told us, they're only there for two things, to survive and remain in business and to profit maximize. So that strategic intent will really, really help answer how they navigate the innovation trajectory. I hope that attempts to answer the question. Thanks, Charles. Thank yes, at the back, in the middle here. Thank you. I've seen Professor Goss raise his hand there. So I'm expecting a simple so, question. Um, this, is, this is a bit cheeky of me because it says Q&A to Charles Ekbu and Jamie Hanley. So what I, my question is, um, if you're going to kind of um, apply the kind of concepts that you talked about around knowledge and innovation, how would you apply that to the British political system? So can, can, can you, is that thing on, please? Can we? It's on? Sorry, I missed, I missed that part, please, sorry. The whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, if you don't mind. Yes. So I said again. my question is very cheeky because it's a Q&A to both of you. <laughs> to Charles and to Jamie. So building on the concepts you've introduced around kind of knowledge and innovation, how would you apply that? What would you suggest how we could apply those concepts to the British political system? So it's to both of you. <laughs> well, I have, wow. the right, I have the right man here. Wow. So I'll, I'll pass that on to, to Jamie. Um, Jay, to <laughs> Professor Charles and Jamie. So there. I'll let you go first. I need some thinking time. <laughs> Look, I, I think we already um, seeing what, what's going on. Um, at least in the political system. The political system is 
is why. It's, it's about governance. It's about a de democratic uh, emancipation, government for the people, by the people, and, and for the people. So the coming together of the political elite and those they serve, and how they learn and glean knowledge on a day-to-day -day basis that informs their decision, I think is key. And that's why I'm so interested in this leveling up. Are with me? Because a true leveling up needs to understand what that means at the very, very local community level. Are with me? And the only way to understand that is to hear the voices of those actors that are impacted. And if those actors bring their voices based on their knowledge, assets, and their experience to, to the fore on the political elite, there's something that says, if we're going to do it well, that interplay between the voices raised and the political elite listening to make sure we produce things for the common good. There is power in it. So you can see some association between mm -hmm. knowledge management and the decision making and how that may be, uh, how that, that might pertain in the political class. Just yeah. Well, I, I think the only thing I would add, just from a point of view perhaps of elected politicians, <laughs> is that there has to be a genuine hunger for knowledge um, and the structures of politics have to ensure that politi politi elected politicians can understand the issues. Um, and I, I think, you know, I mean, I'm very conscious that we've got a former member of parliament here in <laughs> Sir John Battle and a current Lord Mayor. John, I don't know whether you would want to add anything to that from a political point of view. Sorry to put you on the spot. For three years, I was. Um, Minister of the Department of Trade and Industry responsible for innovation and technology. I just say, I, I thought it was a fantastic question. And I, I've got a tremendous amount from the lecture because you focus so intensely on the process. Yeah. And the problem is we neglect the process. And so we look for the quick fixes because politics is so short term. Yeah. And it's having the courage to listen more to the longer time uh, term ideas. Ironically, it was Michael Porter that the civil servants were throwing at me all the time yeah. <laughs> in, in terms of innovation. But I, I think it's the great, um, I'm trying to remember his name, PJ O'Rourke, uh, the commentator in America who died recently, he was asked what was the point of politics? And he said it was to sustain an image of competence from one day to the next, because all they're interested <laughs> in is survival. Now, that short-termism writ large, and notably, it was the image of competence. And I think yeah. the difficulty is to get away from images of competence to actual competence yeah. using the kind of questions that you've raised tonight. And, and, and that does mean that the big gap I find is that people go into politics with campaign training, mm. but not governance training. And what politicians that end up in leadership positions, mm -hmm. whether in councils or parliament, do need training and working at the, the task, if you like, the craft of governance, and that should include innovation. Excellent, thank you. Thank you, John. Um, we've got some questions online, I think. Yes, um, we've got two questions that have come in online. Um, so the first, um, is from Maria Burke, who says, thank you for a very interesting and thoughtful lecture. I was wondering, what are your views slash thoughts about the future of knowledge management in construction in terms of the emphasis on sustainability? That's, that's, uh, can, you, Colin, can you hear me? Yeah. That, that's an interesting question. And uh, um, it's one of the latter uh, research projects uh, um, I've been doing with uh, some of my um, students. And of course, sustainability in its wider sense, uh, whether it's economic sustainability, social sustainability, as, as, as well as uh, um, environmental sustainability. One of the things uh, we were doing, it's, uh, I, I had uh, one of uh, my PhD students many years ago, uh, Dr. Anthony Lumulaye, looked at how knowledge has a role to play with human resources and how knowledge has a role to play with equity and social justice as part of sustainability. 
I give you an example of how we looked at um, knowledge mapping in a sustainable urban environment using how we look at glass wastage as part of uh, environmental sustainability. I think it has a role to play, especially when you look at what social justice means, what equity means, what parity means, which has both a moral connotation, a social embeddedness, and also the individual and the society. Are with me? And how are you going to navigate how society understands the positioning of the individual and how the individual attempts to understand how society sees him or her and how that knowledge exchange, knowledge communication, understanding the two, two spaces, but understand that they have to come together. So that's the kind of work we are doing really, really socially embedded. Um, but I'm happy to discuss how that work is going. Yes. Can and I the ask the second question? Yeah. Great, um, thank you. So the second question is, how can developing countries with existing challenges in knowledge management in key governance areas manage knowledge in built environment? That's an interesting one. And uh, I've had an opportunity to travel to uh, countries like uh, um, Nigeria, where I hail from. And I've uh, been able to give uh, some talk on knowledge management in quantity surveying practices in, 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 in Nigeria. Now, there are two things. One of the things I attempted to do is to look at the two strategies for knowledge management. One is the codification strategy. One is the personalization strategy. And the codification strategy talks about how you get all the no no knowledge assets and put into an explicit form which you can share widely. Mm. And in some of our developing countries where the technology is not as mature or where the governance structures takes a different perspective, you need to ask yourself in the different areas you work, which strategy of knowledge management is likely to provide the benefit? I remember um, three years ago, I went to talk about the role of the building information modeling, lessons to learn from the UK to Nigerian quantity surveyors. They were fascinated, but I know that there were some shortcomings because of technology, because of access. Mm -hmm. um, so there are things we need to do. And for me, one of the things I didn't stress is the power of storytelling uh, in terms of tacit knowledge sharing. And one of the things I did explore to them is you guys are very, very wise in what you do. There may be certain things that are not in place, but you need to think about how, as David Skrine in his work on the power of storytelling, how you could use storytelling to really, really affect what you do. And that sits within the culture, the culture of the people. They like to, to express themselves, they like to talk. Why can't we channel that power of storytelling, even in projects, so that when you are writing end of project reconciliation, uh, exercise. You have the project manager towards the end of the project come in and quickly, true story, tell some of the things that have gone well and how he or she have managed to manage change, innovate, and problem solve. And if they can capture that true storytelling, it's a very powerful way of knowledge, knowledge sharing and knowledge management. Thank you. Um, I think we've got time for one more question. You indicated you've seen uh, I've seen, uh, I've seen, uh, I'm sure it's going to ask me a simple question. <laughs> that is Professor um, Chris Goss. Uh, Chris and I have gone a long way back. Uh, Chris and I did our first degree at Leeds Polytechnic when I was doing quantity surveying in the late 80s. He was doing construction management and we've been colleagues for over 30 years. Chris, it, your, sim your simple question. Uh, yes. <laughs> I, I, will, I won't give you that pleasure. Charles, um, it is, you know, it's, it is a pleasure to, to hear you speak and, uh, and, uh, and with the passion that you deliver the topic and you have done for many years. Um, I, my question really is, is I think to, certainly since Drucker first coined the phrase knowledge worker, much has changed. And, and it's really one that relates to the, the current position you hold now is th there's, there's a massive challenge on the knowledge worker and, and, and as I, as I mentioned, things have changed and the resilience and confidence you need to enter into this market now and deal with the vast body of information and data that comes our way every day. 
how do we equip the learner with the right environment, with the right and skills in a place like this to become competent and resilient and become the knowledge worker of the future and the leader of the future. So I know you've certainly got the the, the, the capability of leading and I'm, I'm really, uh, our vice chancellor will be, will, be, will be looking towards you to steal some of that knowledge. So that's what I'm trying to do now. Thank you, Charles. You can see what's an easy question coming from uh, Chris yeah. Goss. Yeah. Chris, I think that's an excellent question. And uh, which is why I often say this whole area is socially embedded. The world is changing. And the way we look after the knowledge worker, or at least the way we look after our staff for whom have embedded implicit and tacit knowledge is important. And I'll just give you an, an example of the kind of things I want to do here in the university. And uh, some of the things I'm trying to put forward have come from my many years of working into knowledge management. One of the things we want to do here in the university is we want to introduce what we call career passports. And some of this thinking have come through my many years of the importance of the individual having real flexibility in an environment they could be picking things up, developing themselves even without knowing. So the articulation of this is, we have students who will come from year one to year three. And of course, when they finish, they go with their degree, first class, two, one, two, two, whatever their ability can get. I also want them to go with something, which is what I call a career passport, which is a coming together of those other knowledge assets and knowledge utils, including resilience, including effective communication, including proficiency in digitalization, ability to commun communicate effectively, ability to sense and have cultural competence because the work they're going to do. And if we're going to provide that in what I call uh, a, a digital repository from at uh, day one, we help them to build that. And by the time they go, we tell them, this is your degree, but see all these things you've built either true working as a volunteer and picking up this, are with me? And you get the tool and you move. That's more likely to stand them in good stead. Similarly, you could say the same thing to staff, um, trying to make sure you develop them, but provide the right environment, which speaks to the way individuals do things. One of the things I have learned from knowledge management, it's don't try to impose heavily, create an environment that people do things without almost knowing, and it becomes a natural thing. They are more likely to pick it up than you, uh, you, you impose. And that is why I'm really, really grateful that as a university, we're now beginning to formalize things like mentoring and coaching. And if we do that well, you can begin to see how some good practices from the mentor can go to the mentee. And the mentor can understand the social embeddedness of that individual and how he as a mentor, she as a mentor, can frame how he mentors, all beginning to develop the, the person, but do it in such a way that sits naturally with how individuals learn and move forward. Well, Charles, thank you very much. Um, I think that last answer, your ambition, your care for our students and our staff shines through. Thank you very much indeed. I'm going to hand over to Professor Sayer to uh, bring the evening to a close. Well, finally, thank you again, Charles. Um, thank you, Jamie, as well, for your handling of the questions and your introduction. Um, we hope you have enjoyed tonight's lecture, which I think you will have found is extraordinarily rich and actually rather entertaining. <laughs> so I don't think you needed to worry about that first slide. I think it was fine. <laughs> Um, for those of you who are with us in person this evening, uh, Charles, Jamie and I would like to invite you uh, to join us for, for drinks, um, reception and a light buffet in the atrium. Uh, for those who joined us online, thank you for doing so. You are very welcome and thank you for your questions posted online as well. We'll be hosting our next inaugural lecture uh, on Tuesday the 7th of June which will be with Professor Kate Adams, and we hope to see you there. Uh, thank you all, and for those of you in the UK, good night. Thank you.